<clears throat> I can hear you out there. I can't see much with the bright lights. Okay, we're here for effective code review. And I believe that effective code review reduces the overall cost of software development. Hopefully by the end of this, you'll agree with that too, and you'll have some actionable uh, ways to start adding uh, code review to your software development process if you don't already have it. And the reason I'm such a fan of uh, code review is I've been developing software for, for 20 years, and probably at least two thirds of that time has been on projects where code review has been a, a critical part of the development process. So I'm really bought into it. Hopefully, hopefully you will be um, by the end. So why do I think, or why do people think that a code review um, reduces the overall cost of software development? If we think about costs of a, of a defect, generally the later that defect is, is found, the greater the cost it is. And code review can be used to find those defects earlier in the software development process. So that's, that's kind of how we save money. We, we, we've got a little bit of overhead um, by doing code review, but the hope is that we find bugs and issues a lot earlier, and therefore the cost of those bugs and issues are much uh, lower. So this talk, we're gonna cover a few main areas. We're gonna do a quick uh, introduction to what actually is code review. Then we'll look at the benefits. We'll see how we can implement it. Uh, finally, I'll give you some tips. And we'll end, I'll just show you how, if you're using GitHub, how you can set up uh, code review uh, in GitHub. Uh, so to start off, what is code review? Um, the obligatory Wikipedia quote. Um, basically, code reviews, we're just looking at code, and we're trying to find defects that we may have missed when we were, when we were writing the code uh, at the start. And there's kind of a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, pair programming, I suppose, or mob programming, is kind of real-time uh, code review. As you're coding away, you're working a team of two or more, each of you working on the same bit of code, and uh, hopefully finding mistakes that the other person's making, so you don't introduce them. Um, and the other way, which is what we're really, what I'm talking about mainly today, or, although a lot of the ideas, you know, applicable to both ways, but I'm kind of talking more about the pull request method, where we create our code. We're largely working in isolation when we're writing our code, and then we create something called a pull request, and then somebody else reviews that code to find potential issues. So the benefits, there's four main benefits I'm gonna go over. Uh, the first is we're gonna reduce the number of defects in our code base. This is probably the primary reason for doing it. But let's have a bit of a chat about what defects are. I'm gonna say there's roughly two types, there's two classifications that I'm gonna talk about. There's bugs. So those might be traditionally what we think as defects. If we ran the code and that code was there, then the application would crash or it wouldn't behave correctly. So when people think of defects, this is probably what they're thinking of. Then there's another uh, section of defects called evolvability defects. And an evolvability defect is code that makes the code base less compliant with standards, uh, more error prone or more difficult to modify or extend or understand. So we might also consider that technical debt. It's kind of, a, I suppose, another word for it. But the interesting thing is there's been some studies on uh, code review and I've linked to the um, studies on the final slide. And they're saying that only actually like 20% of the issues found in code review are probably actually bugs. The rest are evolvability issues. So um, when we're doing code review, we are probably gonna mainly pick up on evolvability issues, technical debt kind of problems. And why is this important? Uh, it's because low evolvability costs us money. Um, either new features take longer to implement, uh, bug fixes take longer, or the overall, you know, if poorly, architect, uh, poorly architected software just costs more in maintenance costs and building costs. So even if we had, even if our development process, you know, made no bugs at all, we would still get benefit from reducing evolvability defects from our code base. Um, and if we kind of think about how this manifests, if you've been on any long-running projects, 
if you think about the cost and the time to develop uh, similar sized projects over time, generally at the start you can develop things pretty quickly, but on poorly architected or, or projects with a lot of uh, technical debt in it, um, those with low evolvability, the cost to generate, or the time and the cost to generate to, to, to produce similar sized features just increases over the length of that project. Whereas if we're careful and we write our software well, um, maybe those costs don't increment as quickly over time. So this is one of our major benefits of code review is fewer defects. Um, but the proportion, of, if, if, if you're thinking that you're going to do code review and find loads of bugs, maybe that's not right. Uh, that's not really ha the best way of thinking about it, especially when you add in some other code quality tools, which we'll, we'll look at in a bit. So it's remembering that probably the most things we're going to find in code review are evolvability. So if we're trying to sell this to, to management who might be uh, skeptical of adding code review, make sure you're counting uh, the, right, the right figures. And evolvability is important because if you reduce evolvability defects, then you reduce the overall cost of software development. So the other benefit of um, code review is um, security issues. There, there are a lot of security issues that are quite hard to detect in an automated fashion. Um, so it just requires somebody to look at the code. Uh, so real example, once I was trying to debug something and as part of the debugging I was writing like username and passwords to logs because I was trying to work out what was going on. And um, I then committed the code, I pushed it up and unfortunately the person reviewing it saw this issue and said, by the way, we're logging uh, sensitive information. Um, now with PHP, I think 8.2, there is the sensitive uh, parameter uh, attributes. So um, if people were reviewing code and they see that, that sensitive information is being logged, then perhaps they would suggest in code review to use the sensitive parameter thing. Um, probably less likely, but if somebody's uh, GitHub account got compromised, somebody might try and do something nefarious, like up, upload files that shouldn't be there, like uh, malware. Um, so if you're doing a review when you, you see a file that you don't really understand why it's there, then it's worth challenging that. And um, there's things called the OWASP top 10, and, and they list a whole selection of, um, of security problems that are common in, pro in projects. And it's worth having a look at the OWASP top 10 cheat sheets. I think they keep changing every so often what, what the highest, what, what the most, uh, uh, what the worst issues are, um, so it's worth keep refreshing those and bearing in mind when you are um, when you are re reviewing code. And of course, if people, if you're looking at code and you think, are they kind of doing their own authentication, or maybe they're they're trying to build their own authentication system? Generally, this is bad. Most of the frameworks have got proper authentication systems. So if you see people trying to invent the stuff, especially around this, which is, which is quite critical, it's got right, then that's the kind of thing you want to be picking up and looking out for uh, when reviewing the code. Uh, so another benefit is spreading the knowledge. Even if you are working nominally on one bit of the code base, but through code review, you're through code review, you're seeing what is happening elsewhere. So you might be focusing on one bit this week, but by doing the reviews, you'll be seeing stuff that's going on all over the code base. So it means we can kind of move away from siloed people. You know, Bob does this bit of code and Jane does that bit of code. That's generally not great. Um, so through code review, we can see what else is going on. We might also see that, oh, I'm doing something similar and somebody's applied a, a, you know, a similar pattern over there or maybe there's some other code that I can, that can reuse. And it's just quite helpful in code review to kind of see what's going on. And of course, other people are looking at your code and, and they can say, oh, by the way, actually, you might want to use this bit of code over here to achieve that thing you're, you're working on. And if we're spreading the knowledge, it means you can go on holiday and not have to worry. You don't have to take your phone with you. You don't have to worry about being called because the knowledge is spread through the team. Um, there's also something called the bus factor. And the bus factor is um, if you have one person that knows everything about the project, if something happens to that person, then you're in trouble. So by spreading the knowledge, instead of having a bus factor of one, uh, you have a bus factor of two or more. That means you know, two, things have to, well, two, two things have to happen to two people before you've lost the knowledge. So spreading knowledge through code review is, is also a really useful benefit, but it's quite hard to quantify it. Um, uh, also, mentoring. 
Um, through code view, if you're reading code, you might see uh, things that your colleagues are doing, which uh, maybe they're new to you. Um, certainly, if you've got people just joining a project, there will be lots of conventions on that project uh, that might not be super obvious. So when people, new, new people to the project, start seeing things and go, OK, in this project, that's how we do it, or, oh, that's quite a neat way of, of doing things. Um, and mentoring, it doesn't necessarily always work that the most experienced person will be, or the least experienced people will be getting you know, uh, knowledge from the most experienced people in terms of software development. It, it could be like time on the project. You could have a relatively junior member on the project, but they've been working on it for a year, and you've got someone who's pretty senior in terms of experience, but they come onto the project, and they don't really know much about it. So this kind of uh, interchange of information is, is, is a benefit of doing code review. So these are kind of the four main areas. We're reducing defects, but probably we'll find we're mainly reducing evolvability defects. Uh, we're going to find security issues, and there's kind of like spreading of knowledge and mentoring. So this was the aim of this talk. I'm, I'm saying effective code review reviews the overall cost of software development. Hopefully by now you're starting to see that actually doing this could well reduce our overall software development costs. So let's look at how we can go around implementing this. Um, I suppose there's roughly two branching strategies we could use. Today I'm going to talk about something called feature-based development. So we've got our main branch. It's pointing at a, a commit in the code base. And then the code we're working on, we create our own branch. We make a number of commits. And then um, that goes off. Somebody else reviews it. And when they're happy and it passes review, the code is merged, and now our code base has all of the information, uh, sorry, all of the changes you made in that branch. There's also trunk-based development, where everyone's just, everyone's just pushing their commits to, to the same branch. Um, that probably works better in a, in a pair programming kind of environment. Um, OK, but before we even get to the stage of reviewing code, we want to do as much automation, automated checks on our code base as possible. Uh, so the first thing is, before we even go and look at somebody else's code to decide and to do any review process on it, we want to make sure that all of the tests are passing. And we'll see in a bit that tests also make the code review process easier. So the first thing is make sure all the tests are running. Then we've got um, sort of coding style linters. So these things like Code Sniffer and uh, PHP CS Fixer. What these do is they just go around the code and format it in a consistent style. So we don't really want to worry like having humans go around and say, you know, that, that, you know, that opening brace should be on a new line. We just have that automated by tools. Then this is something that has progressed a lot in the last uh, few years, and they're advanced static analysis tools. So these are tools in PHP world. They're like PHP Stan and SARM, and these can do quite advanced analysis on your code, and they will potentially find issues. And I'd recommend getting those into your, into your uh, software development process as well. So ideally, what happens is we have some system like GitHub Actions or Jenkins or Circle CI or some uh, CI server that is running all our unit tests, is running um, all our static analysis. And only when all of these things pass do we get to a stage where humans come in and actually look at the code. So if we're given some code to review, these are steps I would recommend going through. The first thing is, do we know the purpose of this, of this change? So um, is there like some tickets in Jira or Trello, or is there some bug we're trying to fix? You need to know this obviously at the start, because otherwise you don't know if the code you're looking at um, uh, is doing the right thing. So starting point is work out what the purpose of this, this code change is. Then I would probably look at the tests, and I'd ask myself, have the tests, you know, if I'm looking at uh, the requirement, does, does the test match this requirement? So if I've changed something, um, you know, if we've come along and we've, we've said um, we need to change this functionality, I would expect a test to have changed that replicates um, the requirement. So I, rather than looking at the de in the detail of code, I just look at the test first and make sure yourself you're happy with that. And then finally, if you're happy with the tests, 
then go and look at the rest of the code, and I'd probably, for most things, recommend going through it commit by commit, but we'll talk about that um, later. So, if you remember, we had two classifications of defects. We had uh, bugs and evolvability defects. It is your tests which are probably going to find the majority of the bugs, but actually, they're probably going to find the bugs you might not even know about it. So, if you um, are reviewing the tests and you think, hang on a minute, this test doesn't really match up with the purpose of this, this change, you might reject the code review at that point and say, I think we need a test. I think you need to change this test to, to reflect what the requirement is. And then that will go back to the developer. They'll go and do their fix. And in doing their fix, they might have, you know, their test might expose a bug, which they then go and fix behind the scenes. So you might have pointed them in direction of a bug, but you might not be aware that you've actually highlighted a bug and they, they've then gone and fixed it. But it's the test element of this which will reveal where most of the bugs are in the system. And that's why it's important that you do have tests in part of your uh, software development process. When you're looking just at the rest of the code, probably the majority of the comments you're going to come up with are about evolvability defects. But if you're using advanced static analysis tools like SAM and PHP STAN, then, and we're going to look at some examples, we were thinking about how we write the code uh, in such a way that these tools are likely to find issues. And again, it, it might be opaque to the person reviewing the code. They might say, I just think we need to change the code in this way so that PHP Stan or SAM have greater understanding of it. And then that goes back to the developer. And then while they're making their change, it might be that PHP, the, the static analysis uncovers a bug, which they then fix before giving it back to you. Um, so the purpose, um, if you're using something like GitHub, you, uh, you create a pull request and it has a description. Don't do what I've done here where there's just no description. Either write a fuller description or link it to whatever ticketing system you're using or way of tracking work. So that's the first question. And if you don't know what you're reviewing, I just pass it straight back and say, can you just add some notes to the pull request just so I know what we're trying to achieve here? And then we're asking ourselves, are the tests doing the right thing? So imagine we're trying to write, we've got some code that's a Slugifier, so it's, it's turning all the letters um, in a string to lowercase, and anything, any spaces or any, any uh, special characters, anything that are non alphanumeric, are replaced with a dash. So if this is essentially what the tests are checking, we can see that the expected output looks wrong. Um, we've said the expected output must all be lowercases. So at this point, I would say I'd highlight this on the test. And if I thought it was really critical, I'd say, well, actually, maybe just go and fix this before I continue, because there might be some implica implications of this fix. So the first question we're asking about the tests is the tests that are there, are they doing the right thing? The next question we're going to ask is, are all the test cases covered? So think about the happy path and think about all the things that could go wrong. So imagine if the only tests we had were the ones on the previous slide, we haven't really considered, well, what happens if we've got special characters in our string? Have we got a test to make sure they turn to dashes? What if we've got like multiple spaces in the string? Should that be multiple dashes or should it be a single dash? So this might form some discussion. This might go back to let, let's, let's work out what we're tr really trying to achieve. And then you probably suggest, I think we need uh, these two extra tests. One where we've got a string with multiple spaces on it, and a second test where we've got um, a non-alphanumeric character in there. And these are our expected outputs. And again, at that stage, possibly I'd say, well, can you go and write these tests first, please? And then I'll go and look at the rest of the code. So we've got our purpose, and then we've checked the tests. So hopefully you can see this is why the tests are so important. And you can also see that you might find issues in the tests which would have led to a bug but you as a reviewer might not know about that bug because by the time you see the code again, the developer will have fixed it. So the next stage is I would then start reviewing all of the code, commit by commit, starting with the oldest one. And these are the kind of questions I'm going to ask myself. Will I understand this code in six months' time? So the great thing about code review is you've got some developer, they're working away, everything is crystal clear in their head, and then you pass it on to someone else who's coming in relatively cold, and they will be thinking, they don't have you know, the knowledge of what was going on in that developer's head. You know? If 
somebody else coming in cold can look at that code and they really understand what's going on, the chances are someone will, you know, other people will understand this in the future as well. So this is why it's really good to have a second pair of eyes who wasn't there in the creation of that code. So will I understand this code in six months? Generally, it means if you're trying to do clever stuff like this, you know, if you're looking at this code, yeah, maybe you can work out what it's doing, but, but I'd argue it's not particularly clear. This is the definite, I don't really know what's going on here. You've got to stop and think about this code uh, for a while. Um, so spoiler alert, what this code does is, oh, actually, sorry, before I go on to that, from a point of view of static analysis as well, this isn't great for static analysis. You know, we don't really know the types, or we're doing something on user details, or we're setting something on the user here, but we don't, we don't really know what we're setting. We don't even know what method we're calling. You know, static analysis can't work that out. So it can't tell us if there are any bugs in there or any potential bugs in there. So this code does the same thing as this. So yeah, this is a bit boring, but I think it's easier to understand. You know, we can just go through, read it line by line, and we can see what's happening. I think that is clearer code to understand. It's a lot less clever, but I think it's more maintainable. And then from a static analysis point of view, uh, the chances are these tools know all about these fields. So if, for example, we went in and changed the name of one of these methods and we forgot to update it elsewhere, our static analysis can warn us about that. So that's the first thing. Will I understand the code in some time in the future? Or do I even understand it now? Next question is, can we remove comments? So the issue with comments in the code base is often uh, comments are written there and then the code evolves, but the comments aren't updated. So we've got something here, we're setting the set status to three, and ho ho uh, helpfully somebody said, by the way, three means the message has been sent. I mean, this is great, but what happens if that magic number changes, or what happens if we change this code? We might lose that comment, or that comment might come out of date, and because there's no way of validating automatically that the comments are correct, we have to leave that to the human. So, the next best stage is, well, can we remove the need for the comment? So could we, for example, put some constants in there? Or maybe could we use an enum? And then we've, instead of saying set status to the digit three, we've got something set status to a message colon colon sent. So that's a lot more readable. Um, and what the computer understands and what the human understands is, is more closely aligned. So, First question is, can we remove any comments that exist by, by, by making the code more clear? Um, but then the second question is, well, well, do we actually need comments? So sometimes the easiest way to express what's going on, this populate template method, you can't just look, in that and look at that and work out what's going on. And if I show you the appropriate comments for that, it would probably be quite hard to read the code to understand exactly what's going on. It would be much easier, as we're humans, to have a look at this and go, right, if I want to use this populate template function, this, this is how I do it. Um, so yeah, there will be times when actually comments are required, and again, that's something you, you, should, you should pick up in code review. And then if comments do exist, uh, are the comments up to date? So if you are looking at a change in a method or a function or a class, it is worth going back to the top of that method or the top of that class to see if there's a comment. And if there is, make sure that the change and the comment are still aligned. Maybe this is a job that AI will take away from us in the future, but for now, I think it's down to us to make those checks. Then we might think, have we made this code as obvious as possible? So we've got this marketing campaign thing, and it's got a method uh, add address, which takes a string, which is a uh, dollar address. And we, what is that address? Is that an email address? Is it a postal address that someone will, will send things to? Is it something else? What we could do is we could suggest to someone, I'm pretty sure this is in, in, in this context, you know, because we know more about it, we say, I think this is an email address, so why don't we make that clear in the name? So instead of calling it add address, we'll call it add email address, and I suggest changing the name of the parameter from address to email address. And then that is much clearer to users or to developers in the future that they are expecting an email address in this context. Now, from a static analysis point of view, this is kind of all right. I mean, we know that email address should be a string, and we have added some text here, but hopefully a developer 
wouldn't call add email address and pass a postal address to that method. But there's no way of automatically checking that. We're relying on humans. We're relying on the developer not making the mistake in the first place, and we're relying on the code reviewer to notice it. So we could go a step further, and we could say, instead of having a string, we could have something called a value object, and that could simply be uh, a class called email address, and it just takes a string, and it's just a wrapper for a string. But then we are, we've got a real warning that, that actually the contents of this should be an email address. And then if we had other bits of the code which had postal address, then maybe they have a postal address object. So there's no way we could accidentally pass the postal address object into this add email address method because we'd be using different, um, different objects. Um, our code would, 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 would tell us you know, if we tried to do that at runtime. But even better, our static analysis tools will see that there's an issue and they'll warn the developer that there's a problem. And this is one of the things. If we can make our code um, understandable by static analysis, then um, that means all of these issues will be found long before we get to code review. So, um, will I understand the code? Can I make the code more obvious? Then the next question is, are we following project conventions? So we've got here a location repository. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, five or six methods in there. And if you notice them, they all, seem, they all start find apart from this one search for location. So this doesn't seem to fit the pattern of whatever naming conventions we have here. So I would probably pull that up and say, look, is there a reason this method isn't called uh, find by location, like all the other methods in there? Now, if you've got an existing project, well, and, or even a new project, if you're adding um, code review to this, probably what you'll get is lots of conversations like this. You say, well, what are we calling our find methods in our repositories? And there'll be many, many questions like this. And what I recommend is start a Slack channel called Coding Standards, and then you can have discussions about each thing. So you could start a conversation. So here I've said, do not use abbreviations. And then in the thread, we can have a series of discussions about that, about why that is good or bad. And then eventually, as a team, we come to con some consensus. And then we would move that information elsewhere to our, our project, um, our, 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 you know, our, our project standards or our company-wide standards. And eventually, that's where it should all end up. But if you're adding this process to an existing project, or you're, you haven't had this process and you've got it on a new project, there will probably be a lot of discussions like this. And it's probably the, this is probably the best intermediate place to have those until you've kind of formalized on something. So naming is really important and, and quite difficult. Uh, if you are. Um, there's, there's kind of places you can get naming conventions from. So design patterns, there are common design patterns in software. And I would say that if you've got something that's a factory, according to the design pattern, I would advocate calling it a factory because that has some meaning in developer world. And even if you are unaware of that, um, other developers will be. Uh, so the original book on design patterns was the Gango for uh, elements of reusable object orientated software. I found that pretty hard going. This head-first design patterns, I read it about 10, 15 years ago. I think it's an amazing book. I definitely recommend reading that if you um, are not familiar with design patterns and, and, and you, know, you like reading as, as opposed to videos for, for reading stuff, for learning things. Uh, the other thing is probably worth doing is have a glossary. Maybe you could add that into your repo or maybe store a wiki somewhere. I always think these things, things like this, is probably best done is part of the code base, because then it's there forever. And once you've got terms in the glossary, I would use them throughout the project. So if you've got things that could be called one thing or another, decide what you want to call it, and just consistently call it that everywhere. So when you're talking about it, so for example, in one of our projects, we've got this kind of concept of a manufacturer retailer, or a test retailer, or an internal retailer. And they all mean the same thing. So what we settle on is we'll just call these internal retailers. So in the code base, we'll, we'll refer to them as internal retailer. When we're discussing it with other developers, we'll call it internal retailer. And we'll document it in, in, in our project uh, glossary. Um, there are times when we've got to be pragmatic, and we will deliberately add code in that is technical debt, that's uh, low evolvability code. And 
if you have to do that, just make sure it is documented. So a real life example, I was working on a project and we were looking at some code around gift vouchers. And for this particular client, their gift vouchers spikes massively in December. So it was better to get substandard code out by the end of November so we could get this December bounce than waiting for perfect code and releasing it basically after Christmas because then we would lose so much in income. So there were times when we were like, I know this isn't the right way, I'm hard coding the price of it, it's okay because it's not gonna change in this month, but I do need to remember to fix this later. So what I recommend is put a to-do comment on it and link it to whatever Trello card, whatever ticketing system you have. So this, this has got two benefits. One, the person reviewing the code sees that it was a deliberate hack and they can debate whether it's a good thing or not. But also all that technical debt is captured somewhere so that at some stage, hopefully, it can be reviewed. Um, other things to think about, is the architecture any good? Um, have they, have they over-architected? Have they made things too complicated? Or is it too simple? Is there... Um, encapsulation done right, is there information leakage where there shouldn't be. Um, although I think big architectural decisions should be discussed before coding, and we're going to come back to that. Um, and then finally, are there actually any bugs? So this is the checklist of things that you want to be doing as you're going through your code, um, commit by commit. These are the kind of the questions that I think you should be asking. So who should do code review? I think everyone should do code review. Um, the whole team should be doing it. We should all be looking at each other's code uh, rather than just having one person, like the tech lead, reviewing it. I think it's beneficial for everyone to do it for, for some of the uh, reasons we've outlined earlier. So I just want to go through a few tips. I've been doing code review for quite a while now and I've made many mistakes, so here are some of them that I'm going to share with you so hopefully you don't have to make the same mistakes uh, I made. First one, and this is probably the most important, it is called code review. It's not design review or any, anything about how we're going to build this code, it is reviewing the code. So if we're doing something that's a big feature or if we're doing something that's a change to how we've done things, don't wait till the code review stage to have those discussions. So have a chat with people early. So if it's any big feature or anything that's changing, before I even start a line of code, I would chat with someone else and just talk things through. How are we gonna go and achieve this? Then you write the code, and then you do the code review. Now, if you don't have this pre-chat at the start, and you just go in and write something, and you're working away at something for a month, and then you get to the review, and the other person thinks, I don't think we should have done it like that, there's so much resistance to making that change. And in reality, it, you've probably just got to keep it in there and just learn from it because it's very unlikely after a month's work, somebody's going to go, no, that's terrible, Let, let's, let's start again. So that's why you have to have this discussion early. And if they are bigger projects, then keep talking. Yeah? If you're working in isolation, do keep checking in with people if you need to bounce ideas off, off things. And possibly, if this is a big feature, have kind of midpoint reviews. So you say, well, I've done this. You know what, just before I go any further, can you have a look at this? Just check and kind of, you know, go in the right direction. You have to go into the same level as detail as you would for the final review, but I just need, you, I just need your opinion to make sure we think we're doing this correctly. So I think this is really, really important. And I've made these mistakes where you've got to the end of something going, oh no, that's not, that's not how we should do it. So the second thing is try and keep, um, where possible, try and keep the amount of code we're reviewing uh, as, as a small amount of, of code as possible. Um, if you're asked to review a very small amount of code, you'll probably find quite a lot of issues. If you've got a huge code review to do, you're probably going to say, looks fine to me. So uh, there's two things I suppose you can you can learn from this. The first thing is if you've got some dodgy code, try and put it through in a huge commit. But I think the better lesson to learn is how can we uh, make smaller changes um, uh, because that is more beneficial. And, and in terms of how much time we should spend reviewing in one go, um, SmartBear um, looked at code review at Cisco and they said, do not 
be reviewing code for more than one hour because you just you know your concentration goes down, and probably stick your code review in you know, chunks of 400 lines of code or, or fewer at a time. So this kind of backs up why we need to make the the changes, the commits that we're reviewing as as small as possible. So most changes will probably be made up of several commits, and I try and make your commits tell a story. So we start a new branch, and we're going to go, um, uh, maybe it's to replace the price calculation service. So we're going to first of all mark that as deprecated. We're going to find all the other places where we need to make changes and mark those as deprecated. Make that a commit. Then the second one is we're going to add some facade to a third party calculation service that we're using to replace this. So add, add all those changes in. Then we're going to update. So where we were talking to the old code, we're talking to the new price calculation service. And then finally, we're going to remove the old price calculation code that we had. And we could do all that in one commit, but then there's quite a lot of stuff going on. If we, if we target it in small commits, then it's like, right, what's, this, what's the purpose of this commit? OK, right, now I understand it. Now I can make sure that we're doing, you know, doing the right thing. It just makes it easier to review. And then finally, somebody will um, merge all that back in. Um, and this, this is why I say when you're going through uh, commits, it's probably best to do them one at a time, starting from the oldest. Definitely make sure you're using separate commits if you're doing white space changes. Um, so if you, ch you know, change the formatting of something, have that all hidden away in one commit. So you know, it's just easier to go, oh, those are just white space changes. Fine, fine, fine. You don't want some logic change and all that, because it's, it's, you're more likely to miss it. If you're renaming things that have quite an impact on the system, so if you're renaming a class or moving it from one namespace to the other, that could have quite a knock-on effect, because everywhere that uses that, you'll have updates in the use statements. So again, I try and isolate that just to a single commit, because then when you're looking through, you're going, yeah, I'm just seeing a load of you know, use statements change and the class name change. Well, that makes sense. You don't want to hide other, other bits in there. Same for like public uh, or protected methods and property names. And I'd also isolate composer updates to their own commit as well. So if you do this with the commits, it makes understanding and reviewing each commit easier. It does mean that if you do have uh, like a, a pull request with lots of commits in it, you can kind of do that in stages. So when you get tired doing the review, you can stop and then, and then move on. You know, as GitHub remembers how far you got to with the review. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite useful. But of course, the best thing is, can we actually reduce the amount of code in our, our pull requests? And often when you're creating new features, you might refactor existing code. So imagine we're going along, and we've done a commit, and then we've done another one, and then we do another commit, which is refactoring. What we can do is we can take that commit that's just got the refactor in and use uh, Git Interactive Freebase, and we could say, all right, instead of having that commit, the third one I did, we'll move it to the first one I'm doing. And then we can just turn that into a, a pull request, and someone can just go and look at this refactor. And we're keeping the refactor different. And even if we don't want the actual code, presumably this refactor is there and is improving the quality of the code base. So even if the other code we're working on, we, 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 we don't take in the end, there's probably benefit in the refactor. So while someone is reviewing the code, we um, continue on our code, and then eventually someone will, will review this. So before, we had one big review, and now we split it out into two or potentially more reviews. And conceptually, that, you know, a, a refactor is nothing to do with new functionality. So we can start splitting them out. And uh, yeah, if you, Git Rebase is your friend here. If you want to learn more about Git Rebase, there was a talk here three hours ago. Hopefully, you went to it. Um, otherwise, just find the video. Um, yeah. So, so this is how we can split things up and, and make it make it easier to review. So, when you're reviewing somebody else's code, here are some tips. You know, don't be rude in this review. Everyone's trying to work hard. Don't be nasty in it. Just just try and be polite and respectful in, in whatever you're saying. Try not to be critical of the author. Don't say you've made this mistake again. You could say, uh, you know, our team's conventions are, are this, or I think we've discussed in past, in, in previously, you know, I think we've agreed previously we, we do things in this way. Um, state the problem and the solution, 
And if it's easy for you to do the solution as a commit, then you could just help out and actually check out the code and, and make the commit um, with the solution, and they can choose to accept it or not. Um, but yeah, don't just state problems. Just offer solutions as well. You might say, I don't really like the name of that variable. The chances are the person who wrote the code didn't like the name of that variable either, and they just couldn't think of a better name. So they might have one name. You say, oh, I don't know, how about using this name instead? And then between you, you might think of a third name, which is even better. So not just problems, give solutions. But if the solutions are quite long, and you found a blog post that explains the problem, or I don't know if anyone uses Stack Overflow anymore, but you can link to that instead. There's no point like rewriting it all in the commit. You say, I think we should do it in this way, and by the way, here's a link that explains it. Um, if you think things have kind of gone off, uh, off course, then maybe we need to chat about it. So you can say, Let, let's chat. When you're convenient with you, we'll have a chat about this, because I, I, I don't want to go further into this, into this, into this um, review because I think I think things have we're probably not doing the right thing so let's have a chat about it instead of just writing loads and loads of comments um, sometimes if I'm pretty sure what they've done is correct but I'm not really sure I might say questions so this is kind of changing it slightly so I'm like 90% sure that you're correct but I'm just questioning this and my expectation is you'll tell me oh it's because of this and, and you know you're right and I'm wrong rather than this is this is something I need you to do and if they've done some good work, let them know they've done some good work. Say, that is really great. Oh, that's great. You, you did this. That's a really neat way of doing it. You know, code review can be quite a negative process because normally what you're doing is just saying, I want you to improve this. But it doesn't have to be. If people have done something good, tell them they've done something good. Um, and then receiving review comments, again, you know, don't be an idiot. Don't be rude. Try, try not to take offense. Like, Everyone's quite busy. It takes a lot longer to write. It's really polite. Oh, by the way, have you done this? Or did you think? You, I think you might have forgotten about that. If they just, so if the person who's reviewing it is a bit more abrupt, you go, okay, they're busy. Their point is valid. I'll, I'll go with it. But just because someone has said I don't agree with this doesn't mean they're right and you're wrong. And if you do disagree with it, then have a discussion about it. Um, I think probably by the time you've, you're going backwards and forwards more than once, you probably. It's probably best done as, as, a, as, a, as a chat. And of course, if they find something, let them know. Go, oh, I'm glad you found that bug. That's really good. I never saw it. Thanks for finding that. And if you're trying to encourage the whole team to do things, if you see a good pull request, why didn't you slack the whole group? Say, check out this person's PR. It's great. And say what you liked about it. This was really easy for me to review because they split the, commit, the, the pull request into several commits, and each commit was focused on one task. So the person who wrote that, Remy, should be delighted to hear this. And also, it's a much more positive way of, of trying to enforce change on, on the team, because you're saying, this is really good, and this is why, and everyone can kind of look at it. It's more, it's more of a positive interaction than saying, God, oh, you've done that wrong again. You haven't broken that out. Um, one issue teams sometimes have is keeping on top of code reviews. They're working away on, on, on code, and then the code reviews are piling up. Your value in any code you write is only realized when it's released, or when it becomes part of it, or it's a refactor, or when it becomes merged into the main, main code base. So if you've gone to all the effort of writing the code, and it's just sitting in code review before it can get merged in, that code is probably more valuable than the code you're working on now because so much effort has already been invested in it. So if it just takes another 15 minutes to get it merged or to get it onto the live server, just do it. So code review generally, apart from critical bugs, I would say is higher priority than working on new code. Um, other things you can do is the, the problem with doing code review is the context, the constant context switching from, I'm writing some new code, oh, now somebody's you know, bugging me to do a code review. So what you can do is you can try and divide your day up a bit. I say, I'm going to have 30 to 60 minutes of focused blocks of time working on something. I turn off all my distractions. There's no slack. My phone's on silent. I'm just going to get in the zone and do this. And you probably don't want much longer than 60 minutes, because even if you can concentrate for a longer time, your eyes would benefit from a rest from looking at the screen. If you're sitting down, you'd benefit from getting up and walking around. So you've got your focused blocks of time where you try not to get interrupted at all. 
And then when you come out of those focus times, you say, right, is there any code for me to review? And again, if people are doing smaller chunks of, thing, uh, smaller chunks of code to review, it's much easier just get, I'll just take 10 minutes to review that code. And then, are there any meetings? Are there any questions? No, all right, I'll go back down into focus time again. So these are some kind of things you can try if on your project, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the code reviews are piling up. Um, finally, I think you need to be pragmatic use of code review. When you're starting, the default, in fact, the default would always be everyone's, you know, every, every bit of code needs reviewing. And when you're introducing it to a new team, I would say make that the default and make it a block that until someone has signed off the code, it cannot get merged into the, the main code base. But after you've been doing this for a while, and once your team's kind of normalized and, uh, around this process, and if it's, if it's you know, a high trust team, then maybe you don't need a human to review everything. So if it's a really small change, I'm correcting a typo. You know, do we really need someone to, to, to check that? Or if I'm just making a small change, I'm changing the color of some CSS thing, and it's already agreed on what the, what the new the color should be, I make that change, it probably doesn't really need someone else to check them. Um, if, as a team, we've agreed on some kind of refactoring, so let's say PHP, I don't know, 8 or 8.1 came in, and now you can do constructor promotion, and maybe every time you see uh, a class, or you open up a class, you go, oh, we'll just change to constructor promotion, put that as a separate commit, get that through um, code review. You could say, the first time you do it, yes, you all need to talk as a team to, to agree that you think this is a good idea, but if you do decide it is, then really those, those pull requests or those, you know, it doesn't really need someone else to view it. You know, if you've got uh, good test coverage and you've got static analysis and you're probably using the IDE to make that change anyway, the chances of there being a mistake is, is pretty low and actually human intervention is probably just wasting time. So by default, we view everything, but then assess from time to time, are there things where this is just too heavyweight and we don't really need it, there's no benefit. So, it's kind of like a summation, uh, the summary of the um, code review tips. If you're doing big chunks of work or you're doing something new, talk to people before you start coding. Don't let the code review be the first point that you have a big discussion on how we're doing something. Try and keep uh, the code in, you know, that the needs reviewing in small quantities. One of the ways you can do that is pulling out any refactoring and make those into their own um, uh, things to be reviewed. Um, be constructive um, when you're being when you're talking about the in, the in the comments. Try not to be nasty to people, and prioritise getting the code view just over the line, rather rather than new work. And be pragmatic about everything. Always, you know, yes, this is a framework for doing things, but then always question it. Always ask, is there a better way of doing things? So finally, just last few minutes, I'm just going to show you how easy it is to set this process up of code view in GitHub. So what I'm saying is code should only be merged in or deployed if our CI passes and the code review passes. So what you do is you go into, into GitHub, you click on settings, and you click on branches, and then there's this choose a branch that you want to protect. So a protected branch will be a branch where I can't push to. Um, it can only be uh, added to through a pull request. So you select the name of the branch, so you select the main branch normally, um, and then it'll ask you, what protection do you want on this branch? So you could say, well, first of all, you say, I want to protect this branch. That means you can't push directly to it. It has to be merged through a pull request. Then um, you can say, initially, require a pull request reviews before merging. So that means somebody's got to say, this is OK. Bearing in mind that last slide we talked about is eventually you might want to move away from that requirement. When you do, you've got to untick this box. Um, I also think this is quite a good one to do, the dismiss uh, stale pull requests. So that means if somebody said this is all fine and then more work was done on that branch, um, then the previous acceptance is kind of, well, that was okay then, but now there's some more work's happened, so we, still, we don't know, you know if, it's, if, if it's still okay. Somebody else needs to, needs to look, at it, look at it. Um, definitely require the branches up to date before merging. So while you're working on this branch, somebody else might have done some other work, which then got merged into the main branch. So you want to make sure that the thing you're actually looking at 
is up to date with what is currently on main. And then finally, um, you'll say, yeah, I want some status checks. So this is basically the, the, the CI things. So you'll tick that box. And if you've never run any of the things in CI, this, this box will be empty. But once you run them the first time, it'll give you a whole list of things that you can do. So they'd be either GitHub Actions or Circle CI or however you're doing it. So I think the takeaway is it really is that simple. Integrating code review into your project workflow, if you're using GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, is really easy. So there's no reason not to, in my opinion. So this is kind of a summary. This is what we've discussed today. My hope is that you agree with me that effective code review can reduce the overall cost of software development. And hopefully, you have seen ways in which to implement it onto your team if that's what you choose to do. And hopefully, it is. Um, so I've been Dave Edmonds. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dave. Right, I think we've got a good 10 minutes for questions. So we've got a question straight away. Let me come over to you. Do you check out the code and run it locally, or do you just review the diff on GitHub? Um, good question. Uh, it depends. So um, it depends on the nature of the change. Uh, my hope is that the automated test should, should be good enough for validating that it actually works. But some of the bigger changes um, do need uh, manual testing. I often, the, the way a lot of our projects are set up is we have something in GitHub that just says deploy this to a particular environment, like a, a, we've got like a, a, a staging environment. So on the times when um, you kind of need to see it in action and interact with it and it's not, you know, it's not on my computer, then often what I'll do is I will click on the button and it will deploy it to the staging server and I'll go and test it on there. But in, in, in a few of the projects I'm on, the person that does that and the person that does the code review are, are different people. So um, if I'm not, so the answer is, <laughs> If it's a simple change that I'm pretty sure, confident the tests will pick up, then I won't check it out. If there's someone else who's responsible for testing that particular thing because they want to see, you know, they're kind of more business focused and they, they want to, you know, check it really does work, um, then I will, you know, sign off the code review. Uh, but before it gets merged in, someone else will then go and deploy it to the server and, 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 and test it. And then there might be situations where it's both I'm wearing the hat of the tester and, 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 the code, and the code review, and then I'll probably, just in most of the projects, I'll probably go and put it on the, on the, on the, on the uh, staging server just because that's how it's set up for. So yeah, probably the answer to your, the quick answer to your question is no, I don't check it out on my <laughs> local machine, but um, hopefully that has illustrated all the, all the kind of points that, uh, how, how I treat it anyway. Is that, happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions? Oh, a couple more. Hello. Uh, do you have any recommendations for those of us um, unfortunate enough to be using SVN uh, for like tooling that can replace stuff that's built into Git? Um, <laughs> quick answer, no. I've, I've used Git for uh, many years now. What, what are you using instead of Git? SVN. Oh, oh, sorry, SVN. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry. I expected that. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, I can't help that. <laughs> I mean, it is 2023 now, so uh, I'd encourage them to move away from SVN. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you say you saw some of that conference, and they said, "Don't don't use SVN anymore." Yeah. Anyway, I've heard it officially from the conference, so uh, yeah, yeah. Carry that message through. <laughs> Uh, how many people would you say should be involved in a code review? So, oh. for instance, for me, we started with a team of three. So one person makes code that the other two review was all fine. Now it's five of us, and we're still doing the same. So obviously, there's more output of code reviews and also more people spending time reviewing. So is there like a, a good limit, or how would you do it? Um, great question. So I think it depends on the size of the team. Um, 
I did uh, a few few years ago. I was working on a team where there might have been six or seven of us, and what we did was we said most reviews you just have one other person look at it, look at it, but actually if it was something that was quite like a big change or something that was quite critical, then we might say I think this is a two-person review. So actually, you know, I'd rather have two people look at this just just to make sure um, you're okay. But I, I don't think you really need. As long as you're, as long as you're distributing the reviews, like across the team, then I don't think you need everyone in the team to look at every single change. The only other thing I'd say is if you had some uh, somebody new to the team or somebody quite junior, then maybe you'd say, well, I think it's beneficial for you doing this code review, but we'll also get it someone else a bit more experienced have a look at it too. So that'd be another instance where maybe two people would look at a. Uh, the same bit of code. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. We've yeah. got time for one yeah, more or two more. Any more questions? It's a couple at the, the front. The Excellent. Oh, they're just bringing the mic uh, down there. Oh, oh you've been intercepted, but you're next. <laughs> uh, so there's just someone with the mic back there, but I'll do you next, yeah. So um, <clears throat> have you got any tips for encouraging people who don't get round to code reviews to actually getting on with code reviews? Well, if so, what we what we do on some projects is uh, we kind of have our our daily like catch ups every every morning, and the workflow is uh, we've got like a, a Trello board, and one of the columns is is code review. So we've got you know the release column is is the rightmost column, and then you've got like a merge, and then a, a code review, and then in progress, and then the stuff, you know, stuff that's still to do. And we, we, we go through from right to left because anything that is, you know, well, anything released is offering value. Anything that merged is not released will say, right, well, what do we need to do to get this released? Um, is there, you know, why, why isn't it released already? And then the next one would be go through, right, we've got all of these um, things in code review and who's going to do them? We might even put their, you know, in the meeting, we might discuss, in the stand-up, we might discuss who's going to do that and put their, put their face on the Trello card so they know that's what they've got to do. Um, and then, then they'll, they'll do the review before, um, you know, if they haven't done the review by the next day, then people say, well, why haven't you done a review? That was your number one priority. That was the first thing for you to be, be working on. So I think displaying it like that makes it really clear to people what needs to be done. Um, and you could... Uh, you know, if they're resistant to do code review, uh, find out wh what what their hesitancy is. You know, I mean, there might be a good reason for it. Um, so I just try and understand why they're unhappy doing it, and then work out what it is. So, so for example, they might think I'm really behind in the work I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want to. I don't have like distraction of code review. But really, as a team. It, it, stop thinking as individuals and think more of a team. That the benefit of the team is to get this code. You know, in, in from code review into merge and then released as quickly as possible, and yeah, try and s you could you could try this to well find out what what their issue is, um, but one of the things you could um, work with them is just explain well that we've got this value and we're not realising it until it's until it's released, um, so uh, that might help. But there's probably some reason why they don't want to do it, and you've just got to get down to the bottom of this. Most of this stuff. The actual process is quite easy. It's the human side that's a bit more challenging. But yeah, just find out what their issue is. Uh, is that, I know it's not really a, is that an okay answer? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're there. Sorry, is that the, the bright light? I can't see anything. Keep, this, keep you on this your toes. In the front, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my question is, uh, do you recommend checking the logs while doing the code review because for a framework like Drupal, it's uh, really easy to miss uh, PHP errors. And if you have your website deployed on platforms like Platform SH, you don't have access to the logs directly. And it's easier with Drupal kind of setup that your site can go down. So at, do you recommend checking the logs during the code review? And at what stage will you recommend to, do, to check? The good, logs. good question. So, if we wanted to check it as code review, just to make sure I've understood correctly, we would have to deploy it to some staging server and then interact with it, would we? And yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you can you can check it on the local or maybe deploy it on a dev environment, yeah. like, like platform as such give you uh, different packages, like you can have three dev yeah. environments, so whenever you push any, sure. any branch, it goes on dev and you can test, and the reviewer can also test on the dev environment. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to slightly go off on a tangent and hopefully link back to the answer. So on, on the projects I work on, all of our environments use Sentry vlogging or Bugsnag, one of the two. So, and even for the dev and the staging environments. So anytime something happens, and I would imagine, I'm, I've, I've, I've not used Drupal, um, so I'm not sure of the intricacies of it, but I imagine if, if it puts something, there would be a way, I, I would imagine, for Sentry to catch any of those logs and um, uh, put them uh, and, and alert, the, uh, alert the dev team if they're, if they are, if they're like the, the staging of the dev environments. So um, I'd probably recommend setting that up because then it's really, really easy to see things that are going wrong. Um, so it sounds to me like part of the process that you'll have to go through is, 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 is actually deploying it to check it, check it all works. So I think at that stage, um, so probably the process would be, I'd review it manually and go, yeah, I'm happy with that. Right now, I need to get this put on one of the relevant environments that platform.sh offers me, interact with it, and check I haven't received any errors on bug snag or sentry. And then if I haven't, then I'll say, yeah, that's, that's okay. I think that's probably, is that, would that workflow work or is that, yeah? That's what you do it, yes. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to know your thoughts. Um. Uh, but yeah, those are my thoughts. I've, unfortunately, I don't have any, any experience with, with uh, Drupal specifically. But yeah, I think that's what I would do. If part of me, uh, one of the early questions when I was talking about like, the testing hat and the code review hat, uh, if I've got my testing hat on, um, then part of that would be I wouldn't expect any, I wouldn't expect, you know, if I put it on my staging environment, I wouldn't expect to see any alerts come through. And if I did, then yeah, I would have to go and investigate what that problem was. And then yeah, so, so the rever rever code reviewer should be checking the logs as well yeah. as part of the review. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's right. I think we may have to leave it there because I know it's uh, refreshment break time. Um, we've got a half an hour break, uh, same place you had lunch, and hopefully we'll see you back here at quarter past. Can we say thank you again to Dave for 